Hello, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining uh, the, the panel. Uh, I know it's, it's day three or four for many of you, and, and so I appreciate your continued interest in, in, in sitting down with us today. Uh, my name is Stephen Ward. Uh, I currently lead climate and sustainability science uh, on our core ESG team uh, within audit and assurance uh, at Deloitte. I am a 25-year geospatial scientist who has spent his career uh, focused on uh, working at the nexus of humans and dynamics within the uh, physical environment. So really looking at that influence that we have on environments as well as the influence that environment has on us as people, economies, uh, society, culture. Uh, I started my career uh, consulting in the oil and gas sector, uh, eventually landed at a small startup called the Climate Corporation, working in sustainable agriculture and data-driven agriculture, transitioned to Oak Ridge National Lab where I led um, geospatial data science and artificial intelligence, uh, looking at climate food security, national security issues, and have been with Deloitte now for about 18 months. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Jonathan. We're gonna talk to you a little bit today about uh, Deloitte, our experience working in this sector, uh, what we're seeing, and, and uh, then want to lay it out that this is intended to be a conversation with all of you. Uh, so feel free to get engaged, to raise your hand, ask us questions. We certainly can talk for the entire time, uh, but I think it's, it's going to be more meaningful if we're able to communicate what we're seeing in the market space where the science and the market are, are, are intersecting and, and have that conversation with all of you. Jonathan. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Great, great introduction. Hey, everybody. Nice to meet you all. Um, thanks for having me here. Uh, Jonathan Schollenfrey. I'm a leader in our sustainability, climate, and equity practice at Deloitte. I advise clients around how to operate in a low-carbon economy uh, across several different industries. I've been with Deloitte for about 15 years. I have been advising clients in multiple uh, industries around the challenges to decarbonize their business, making trade-offs between financial analysis, um, the in-the-money option versus a decarbonization option as uh, organizations do that trade-off analysis. I have a, um, a very quantitative background in decision science, and decision science, it required the quantification of non-financial benefits. So the quantification of non-financial benefits typically were ESG factors, uh, climate-related factors, governance-related factors. Um, like I've advised uh, organizations, uh, a forestry company, around indigenous um, relationship options and how to potentially quantify and the prioritization of, of those types of relationships. On the climate side, I've advised um, big oil, um, super major oil and gas companies, uh, CPG companies, telecommunication companies around their decarbonization pathways and how they could potentially operate in a low carbon economy, uh, making the trade-offs between really continuing to generate profit, identifying opportunity, and uh, reducing their carbon footprint, which is no easy task. So thanks for, for having us. Um, my colleague Stephen and I uh, operate in what we call an integrated offering at Deloitte. It's Deloitte's commitment to a low carbon economy uh, where we are working on the path to net zero uh, offering for our clients and trying to bring the breadth and the best of Deloitte to our clients in order for them to really manage uh, in, in, this, in this low carbon economy. So that's a little bit about me and, and, um, and Stephen has an amazing um, CV as well. And we have definitely uh, varying backgrounds. So I think it should be a really healthy dialogue. Definitely encourage you all to ask questions. I hate lecturing and uh, would love to really just have an informal dialogue in terms of what problems are you seeing and just understanding what others are doing so that you might get access to what others are doing. I think that's one of the benefits of being a consultant overall. Yeah. I'm gonna kick it off, Stephen, and maybe um, just ask a, a quick question to you and then maybe we could broaden it to the, the overall group and that is, what challenges are you seeing uh, for companies that, to, that are trying to operate in a low carbon economy? Yeah, they, they're certainly uh, every, client that we engage with, regardless of industry, regardless of sector, 
uh, has its own sort of nuanced spin on, on their decarbonization journey. Th there is no one size fits all solution, but there are consistent themes uh, and challenges that we're seeing throughout it. Uh, and one of them, uh, frankly, the, probably the biggest that we, we're seeing right now uh, in this sort of nascent or, or emerging space is, is data. If data is going to be an organization's lifeblood that carries them through their ESG journey, regardless of who they want to be or, or, or what regulations they potentially fall under. Uh, and, and, and the reason that it's hard is, is one, companies have not been, uh, they, they, they've not built the capacity yet uh, to capture a lot of this data in their everyday work streams. It's not been part of their thought process, processes and, and traditional sort of governance structure. And so they're having to build that. So un having that strong data strategy, that strong data provenance and curation system in place will be the, the one item that carries through, I think, that, that maintains consistency throughout the ESG journey. There are lots of technologies. Uh, th these are ephemeral. They're going to come and go. The software is going to come and go. The policies, the regulations are going to continue to expand and grow and change. Your data tells your story. And at the end of the day, what we, what we want clients to be able to do is tell their own story as opposed to letting someone else tell it for them. Uh, so, so I'd almost open it up to the floor and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the question a little bit. Are any of you working or representing organizations uh, right now that have set decarbonization or net zero targets, uh, are working towards your own sort of net zero strategy? Anyone, we got a quiet shop. We have one. <laughs> Ma'am, who, who, who are you with? I'm a professor at USC. I'm working with um, the state of California and Los Angeles um, in ordering, excuse me, in order to um, create net zero for the city of Los Angeles. The city of Los Angeles, and, and that presents an even bigger challenge, I think, than some organizations. Are, are you far enough along in the process yet to uh, have, have sort of run up against some of these challenges, I can imagine, with the different sort of organizations under the city umbrella. One of the first things we did is to create a consortium of um, universities and private sector to address these issues. Uh, we're in year three of that. Um, funding is always challenging, but um, creating a private sector relationship is, is pretty critical in doing that. Um, as you can imagine, I'm on the policy side, so that in itself presents a lot of issues, as particularly around uh, unions, for example, and trying to change those pieces of it, especially around the port. Um, so I can get into a lot more specifics, but I'm not a speaker, so <laughs> I'll pass it. No, I, I, I appreciate it, and, and feel free if anyone wants to uh, sort of comment. Um, maybe maybe we could shape yeah. shape the question in terms of the da the data story that you were telling, Stephen. Yeah. I guess w one follow up question would be: Is data does that story resonate with this with this group? And I, I would actually maybe start segmenting that question into: Is it that we don't know what data to collect? Is it that we don't know the segmentation that is going to be most insightful? Um, is it that we don't have the tools uh, in order to extract the data because it's already there and uh, we're uncomfortable and un not confident with the data? So I've just rattled off like several questions ar around data, but if we were to shape that, and I'm, I'm happy to kind of like lean in uh, on, on some client stories and, and, and provide some guidance as to what others are doing and what others are facing, but would love to hear from this room if that data story resonates with, with any of you, if there's uh, a certain area in data that you wanted to kind of uh, talk about and understand uh, from, from other, other client stories. Duke? Is there such a decarbonization of ESG? I just don't know what the subject is. This is, this is around decarbonization, which, you know, within the entire ESG landscape uh, right now, uh, the lion's share of activity that we're seeing in the private sector is, is people tackling their inventory and their carbon accounting and, and beginning to sort of figure out how to decarbonize as an organization. There are, of course, many other there are sort of physical and climate risks. There are uh, transition risks and opportunities. There are all the other elements of the E, the S, and the G. Uh, in terms of where people are on-ramping for their journey right now, uh, most of the activity, and, and it makes sense based on, on sort of current uh, 
proposed regulations, some of what's happening even in the last two days in, in Europe with I, and the international market with ISSB's first two rulings. And so uh, that's where we're seeing most of the focus right now. And, and, and why data is so important is, it's really you have to know, it, there, there's often a trap for, with organizations. Decarbonization, path Decarbonization. to net zero. Decarbonization. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. This, is, this falls under the really dumb question from a yes. complete yeah. lay person, but a dumb question. Oh, what <laughs> data are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. What exactly. Uh, are you collecting, I mean, down to the, the studs? So, sort of so if, there, if there's two segmentations of data overall when we start thinking about path to net zero, there's GHG emissions based on what inventory of assets you have and how are they emitting uh, carbon overall. And then there's the cost in order to ultimately reduce those carbon emissions. So really, when we start talking about data collection, it's what's the asset portfolio, one? What is the GHG emissions that is um, ascribed, that you would ascribe to that, that portfolio? What technology is out there that could potentially reduce it? And what are the costs associated with that reduction? I would say that those are probably the predominant categories that we should start thinking about when we talk about data collection. Yeah. I think Duke, you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, we could make this Pac-12 discussion. So Arizona State University, I was just on your campus uh, two weeks ago. There's the data collection, and at ASU, you know, we have 330 days of sunshine, sunshine so we better be collecting not only data, but uh, you know, uh, turning that into energy, which we are, it's the turning around of that data into something that people recognize is happening all around them and the changes. So they begin to become familiar with the data, want to see it improve. So we've got monitors around campus, as I'll bet others do, showing campus metabolism and what's happening in the building that you're occupying mm -hmm. and why your behaviors contribute to our ability to decarbonize. And frankly, if universities don't do it, I don't know who will. I know corporations are as, as well. But, you know, we run our own little cities. We ought to be demonstration projects of how this all works. But turning the data around into uh, something that people can see, visualize, become familiar with, want to see improve, I think is crucial. It's a great, it's a great point. I, th I think that step number one is really defining the data criteria that you would that you would want to collect information on right and then and then it's what are the tools that you have are you doing it manually are there data extraction tools that that you can potentially employ i have a couple clients that are doing a lot manually and they're like well it's a lot of effort to check double check triple check the data because the SEC rule is coming uh, over the horizon and that they're going to feel responsible and that they're going to be audited for the information that they're ultimately going to be disclosing uh, based on their existing footprint. So, so there's the manual side, there's the um, there's data extraction tools, there's the error checking uh, process. So there's a lot that, that's, that's around data in terms of the definition of the criteria, the tools, and the just the, the, the way that yeah. you collect so it. To put it in a little more maybe a, of, a, of a tangible perspective, let's, let's uh, talk about a, a, a winery, right? Uh, they and the types of data they're going to collect. So they've got effectively two businesses. They have grape to, to bottle. They have bottle to, to table uh, in, in, a, in a very crude manner uh, of dissecting it. They need to understand how much fertilizer is being put on their vineyard. What, how, much, how much is that contributing to their emissions? those calculations, they need to understand how many emissions are coming off the creation of each bottle <laughs> that they produce, of each label they produce, of each cork they produce. They need to sum all of that up. That's going to come in the form of three different emissions categories, uh, but, but really ultimately burns down, or comes down to how much energy are you using. So the types of data we're collecting, of course we're collecting, you know, in the sense of ag and agriculture, we're collecting data associated with pounds of, of nitrogen per acre or fertilizer per acre or hours of machine and equipment operation. Uh, but we're also going all the way down to collecting every individual uh, electricity invoice, every propane invoice, every natural gas invoice. 
So imagine that across an organization that has 50 different locations in 13 different countries, 12 different languages, 10 different languages, all of them may be using different units of measurement. There's a lot of work that goes into translating all that into what we call CO2 equivalent that is uniform across the entire organization so they're all speaking the same language. And why is this important? It's important because you have to know who you are in order to identify who you want to be from a target setting standpoint. Uh, and there's some organizations that just don't have the levers to pull right away in the short term to be net zero. That doesn't mean they can't set a very meaningful target, but, it, but they need to understand this data and where these, uh, where these sort of levers are that they can pull within their organization to reduce emissions in order, bef in order to set a responsible target that can reasonably be achieved. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, a, 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 another layperson here. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm curious, just to bring in another um, kind of big theme of this week, and also on the point about data collection. Um, I'm curious about the current state of AI in, in this space, uh, both for, um, I'm curious when it, when it what software exists, what software might be coming down the pipeline, when that would get introduced into this data collection workflow, or yeah. the stream, and also might it be able to help solve the problem of not being able to get enough data um, if, you, if you know the, the software would be trained somewhere else. So I'm just curious generally what the state of AI yeah. is in the space. Well, I've, I've had chat GPT write a uh, uh, ESG report as a test and, and none of us are gonna lose our jobs right now. It's, uh, it's got a little bit of ways to go, but as with any AI, uh, whether it's a generative model or, or CNN or any other model, uh, it, it's going to continue to improve and improve at, at a, a pretty incredible pace. Uh, in terms of this, this data processing and the data munging, we are already seeing uh, organizations and third-party companies emerge that are building and leveraging uh, AI tech or, or just more traditional lightweight machine learning to assist with uh, that data munging and that data problem. Uh, we're also seeing companies emerge that are doing some fantastic uh, AI, some probability-based uh, uh, measurements and or probability based algorithms that will predict within a certain industry based on your total revenue, based on what you do, they're actually fairly accurately putting you in the right space uh, and predicting where your largest GHG emissions are coming from, wh what's driving variability in your footprint, and what the greatest opportunity is. Cannot tell you how big a game changer that's gonna be when it, when it gets to a point that it's reasonable and trustworthy to be able to have that conversation with organizations, to be able to walk in and take what's a very abstract topic to many of them, it's hard to wrap your head around, or you're swimming in acronyms, uh, and be able to say to them, this is very likely what's driving the variance in your decarbonization or your carbon footprint right now in the decarbonization process you wanna go into. Now, on the climate side, we've been using AI for, for over a decade uh, in, in some of the large sort of models that are producing the baseline climate data that's, that's driving uh, a lot of the GHG protocols and standards. I think, Sarah, you had a question. Uh, in the context of all these data collection issues, how would a proposed, if there would be one, carbon tax be enacted? I, I think, did any of you watch Stephen uh, uh, Coonan's uh, address yesterday? I, I sit, I, I know both Chris and Steve well. Uh, I sit very much in the same camp as both of them in terms of I think carbon, carbon tax uh, is, can be a very useful driver and uh, incentivizer. Uh, I, I, whether it happens, I, I am very unsure. And, and, but I, I do believe in, and this gets to the point of this whole notion of net zero uh, and, and is it achievable? Can we get there? Current legislation, according to the UN, has us at 2.8 degree warming uh, before uh, or in the next, you know, 100 years. So, so there, there are several ju jurisdictions that already impose carbon tax, um, the EU, UK, uh, Canada. So there are different regimes, different philosophies for different regimes. The U.S. has chosen not to impose the carbon tax. However, um, the 
regimes that are international will ultimately surface in cross-border adjustments. So there will be implicit price of carbon overall in the United States as a result of these other jurisdictions that are ultimately imposing uh, different philosophies uh, for tax. Uh, in Canada, there are um, there's a federal backstop for carbon tax, and then it's driven by a different provinces. So each province can put their own carbon tax regime on top of activities. It definitely influences behavior. Uh, it is a punitive, it's a punitive approach. Uh, that punitive approach will um, ultimately result in action. Uh, the U.S. has implemented the IRA. The IRA is more of an incentive-based structure, which is really, um, I guess, delivering almost three, four hundred sixteen billion dollars or something like that to, uh, to to carbon change. And the fact that 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 money is available to uh, companies in the United States, and there is a huge incentive in order to do that, they are jumping on top of that opportunity. I, I think that given the political environment in the United States, carbon tax will probably be driven by what regime is in office in terms of what those perspectives are. I don't know if I see like a, a clear cut landscape as to who's gonna do what, and therefore I do think that the implicit price of carbon is going to be influencing uh, decisions in the United States through the cross-border adjustments, one, and then global, uh, global organizations, uh, organizations that have ex significant, significant exposures to the, uh, the tax in regime and the tax environment are already uh, putting shadow prices on their, their portfolios. So a lot of the clients that I work with will already perform shadow pricing of carbon taxes on their regimes to kind of do a trade-off analysis for ROI investments. Yeah, of course. Ma'am, I think you were, you're next, yeah. Um, I'm totally ignorant of most of this. I don't have a company, but what I'm curious about, I understand what you're trying to do with corporations that mm -hmm. and products and, and cars and so forth, but what about the environment, like with these fires in Canada, the amount of carbon that's being released, mm -hmm. are you factoring in what that's doing to various cities and so forth, and then the California fires? I mean... Yeah, so, so the way that uh, and when we produce climate models and we produce sort of carbon baselines and, and, and CO2 baseline stocks, that these sorts of events are accounted for in sort of updates uh, to those models uh, and can be projected in. Although they seem massive right now, one individual fire won't change the output of a global you know, circulation model uh, a ton when you project it out over 100 years. Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty in these models. Uh, but when we're dealing, if we're dealing with any client that... Uh, sits within, or, or, and, and Jonathan spoke to those sort of assets and asset locations earlier, if we're working with a city or a municipal government, uh, we are going to assess what is, is pertinent and relevant to them uh, from, a, from a small regional perspective, whether that's fire, so out here, obviously water and, and fire would be top of mind. Uh, I live in South Louisiana. That's not the case. We have all the water that we need, and we're, we don't really worry about fires, but we've, of course, got our own issues that, that we have to deal with. Uh, so any time that we work with a client, we, we do not take a generalized approach. We take a top-down sort of dimension reduction approach to really uh, customize any analysis that we're doing from an inventory side of things or from a physical risk side of things uh, in order to help them develop a decarbonization strategy and plan that aligns with and accounts for those local, uh, more localized issues, although that issue, of course, is, is, is quite large. I might, I might jump point. in on, on that yeah. one. It's a, it's a great answer, Stephen. I, maybe to, to also help, help frame it, there's really two categories of climate analysis. One is physical risk, which is the fires that are happening and the resiliency that you need to build as an organization to potentially um, mitigate uh, the damage from, from those physical um, those physical hazards actually happening, and then there's the transition risk. The example that that you that you provided, I think, where we typically do the, our analysis is on the physical risk side, where we say a fire occurring 
is going to potentially impact, negatively impact your business. As a result of that, this is the type of resiliency that we would recommend you engage in in order to immunize yourself against that particular hazard. On the, on the, on the transition risk side, it's here's what you're doing that's contributing to a, a um, in, increased carbon atmosphere. And as a result of this, these are the activities that you could potentially engage in that would ultimately directly impact the, um, the amount of emissions into the atmosphere. Um, so, so we, and, and then here, and then we provide roadmaps uh, uh, to, to Stephen's point around, you know, where are you emitting? What is the opportunity to reduce those emissions? Uh, but I don't think we, we kind of um, combine the fires uh, emitting the carbon into the atmosphere. I think that just changes well, what's the your point, What you're pointing to here, and you've probably heard a lot about it this week, is, is, is people sort of talking about the fragility of, of offsets, uh, particularly you know, the, the bioengineering or bioengineered offset space when we're talking about forest carbon, it's extremely volatile because we can lose it uh, uh, when it comes to a fire. You know, we can lose long-term soil carbon sequestration with management practices. If someone comes in and tills and rip tills a field, uh, we, can, we can lose a lot of what's there. So when we're talking about offsets and, and uh, we really want to uh, lean towards some of those that are more stable and long-term in nature, some of the geologic sequestration and others that are out there. Uh, and that's not to say that uh, forest reforestation isn't, isn't a positive impact and benefit, but there is always that volatility and risk with uh, sort of biologically, biologically captured carbon. Sarah, I think you had a question. We'll get to you first. Thank you. Um, I want to come in as someone who is working closely with smallholder farmers, mm -hmm. especially from a developing country. Um, my name is Joe. I'm one of the first ever fellow, and we are working closely with USAID Feed the Future Initiative, which is a US government global food security and hunger initiative. Mm -hmm. So um, my, I have a question, and my question comes from an assumption that you know, um, for the um, um, transitioning into sustainable agriculture and food system is extremely resource intensive, especially retrofitting or overlaying new infrastructures. Mm -hmm. And then for the case of Myanmar, you know, obviously Myanmar is under a lot of strains, political strains, like military coup, but some other developing countries also have the same challenge. For example, Myanmar, we do have a um, um, national climate strategy, seven years, you know, but it's put aside. And also, you know, like their organization like GGGI, but also they can collaborate with the government. So we solely have to rely on more like to watch, lean towards private sector because, you know, they are more efficient in terms of, you know, red compared to public sector. So my question is, um, what is, from your experience working in Asia Pacific or Southeast Asia, what is, uh, what is the, I'm wondering, what is the appetite or willingness of these larger corporations to bring in the necessary tools, resources, and especially financial resources to transition to help you know uh, um, you know uh, us to transition into sustainable system, especially agriculture and food systems. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> I have the the benefit of of working for some of those organizations in the past, and I have the benefit now of actually working with with a couple of the the larger sort of. Uh, ag industry corporations right now, and, and I would say the appetite is extremely high. Uh, those organizations see themselves as uh, fast movers and first movers in this space, and they see the small hold market, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, as a massive, massive opportunity for change. They also recognize that it's not going to be easy. The, the political climate, uh, even to work and operate in some of those countries, is is difficult for some of these large companies. Uh, but the commitments they're making to source raw materials from and, and some of the work we're doing right now to help them develop plans and strategies to source raw materials for their products uh, from the smallhold farmers that are sustainably uh, operating and providing them with uh, the necessary digital tools. So while many of these farmers lack, in, in these small hold operations, lack uh, a lot of the equipment technology necessary to use satellites and precision farming and all of the other advances that we're seeing used in the Western world, all of them have a telephone. And, and, and that phone has been the link to providing data and information. There are digital agronomy programs 
There are AI tools now for these folks to sell and market their their uh, tools. We, we've uh, I work with one company that's now reached over three million smallhold farmers in India with a tool that helps them broker their own uh, their own produce direct to market, cutting out the multiple middlemen and increasing their profits by sixty percent. Uh, so, are we there yet? No. Is it happening? And is are the eyes of these big organizations turning to that part of the world? Absolutely. I actually was interviewed by uh, Aspen uh, Ideas, and that the interview was on their website. I actually um, coined the word called South Shoring. You know, so um, sourcing more raw materials, like you say, from global South countries, mm -hmm. which is in a way to democratize the supply chains. You know, obviously, a country like Myanmar is a quintessential, you know, like developing country where we can contribute a lot to food security and even to transition it into sustainable food system. For example, Myanmar is second, world's second largest exporter of beans and pulses and peas. Mm -hmm. and third largest producer of beans, largest and peas. Mm -hmm. That means these are extremely important raw materials for plant-based proteins, sustainable. <coughs> Absolutely. So these interesting points. You know, so Absolutely. I'm happy to talk uh, with you more after this. And may, may, yeah. Maybe just to add on to that, uh, fi financing is also a huge, a huge barrier for developing countries yes. uh, as well. So I, you know, I definitely understand that the technology needs to be exported. Uh, the capabilities uh, would would be beneficial to to these environments, but the financing structures are also nascent, and there's a lot of work to do. Uh, and and like the USAID uh, has many many RFPs, uh, particularly in in the South Pacific, around how we can and help um, fund the infrastructure required in order to, to build the, the sustainable future, for sure. Yes, ma'am. Good, good morning. My name is Jean Gould, and I'm with Marathon Petroleum. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just kind of where we are in the data collection, um, obviously, we've got quite a few challenges in front of us. We are, we do have set goals for um, scope one, scope two, scope three. Um, certainly, I, I would assume there's always more refinements in the scope three. Mm -hmm. um, I think with Jonathan, I think where we are um, is a lot of now focus on preparing for impending SEC rules, and I know that's kind of the internal controllers. That's what they're really focused on right now. And the other thing, going back to the, the carbon tax issues, and I agree with everybody's points, um, and just I've been in a couple meetings the last few weeks with DOE on folks that are in their carbon management, their um, Office of Carbon Demonstration Projects. And so they are just, you know, it's all about the carrots. It's all about the, the resources that they're plowing in, whether it's the IRA or the infrastructure bill. And so we are working, you know, they s really see what they are pushing is they recognize the value of getting the private sector involved and it's gotta be that private um, public sector engagement that's really gonna be critical in solving a lot of these extremely challenging efforts, issues. It's, Thank it's you. A, it's, a it's a great point. I actually um, worked on an analog to Marathon um, mm -hmm where they were debating the electrification of the pipeline uh, in terms of what is some of the biggest activities where they could move the needle uh, in terms of their decarbonization strategy. So they were really debating between the electrification of the pipeline versus heat capture technology and really just the trade-offs. And given it was in Canada, so there was that regime, uh, punitive regime environment from, from a carbon pricing perspective, they wanted to start figuring out how to potentially do the trade-offs between the heat capture technology versus electrification so that they could figure out how they could potentially make their commitment, their explicit commitment of a 30% reduction in carbon intensity by 2030 actually happen. And then understand what is the budget envelope that they would need to go to their board to get approval for in order to make that so. And just for uh, everyone's awareness in the room, and, and many of you probably know, uh, but the SEC proposed rule that we keep referencing is a proposed ruling around uh, uh, financial disclosures uh, associated with uh, climate physical risk uh, that 
proposed rule came online uh, last October. It's been delayed a couple of times. Uh, next October is the next sort of ruling date. Uh, wish we had a crystal ball. We could tell you what's going to happen. Uh, but it received more comments, I believe, than any other proposed SEC rule in, in history. Uh, but it is on the docket along with human capital and, and cybersecurity uh, uh, filings. But this would require organizations that are publicly traded in the U.S. to uh, to begin disclosing their GHD inventories, their footprints, their plans, uh, or their uh, assets at risk, their transition uh, risks that they face. Uh, while that has been happening, Europe has been sort of charging ahead with their own sort of standards and frameworks, uh, and, and is moving a little bit quicker than than the U.S. And more uh, aggressively. Yeah, more, much more, much, much more aggressively. The, the terms of the rules, uh, as well as some of the other international markets, and we're beginning to see trickle down pressure. Uh, from those international uh, regulations that are pending and, and, and coming down because the threshold for any private or public company in the U.S. to have to disclose in Europe is actually quite low from a monetary standpoint, from a footprint standpoint. And so we're beginning to see a ramp up in the last sort of quarter of companies having to go ahead and do this now because they have substantial market footprints in, in Europe. Ma'am? Hi, yes. Um, I'm wondering if there's any room, as we work towards decarbonization, to think about environmental reparations. Coming from Puerto Rico, I think about the vast amount of environmental damage that has accrued incredible amounts of wealth for corporations, including the, frankly, destruction of underwater um, aquifers by the hands of uh, pharmaceutical corporations, mm -hmm. as well as worsening coastal erosion. Currently living in New Orleans, I also think about the so-called cancer alley. Furthermore, as we move towards decarbonization and we invest in new technologies, I also think about the threat that indigenous communities are facing as we look to extract lithium uh, from their lands, mostly both in the United States as well as Latin America. So as we work towards decarbonization, I wonder if it's enough and if we can really think about not just achieving that zero, but trying to bridge this environmental gap that a lot of our black, brown, and indigenous communities have faced, um, kind of really uh, holding the toll of an environmental tax to create wealth that we never really see. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. As someone that also lives in Cancer Alley, <laughs> right, up the, right up the road from you in, in, in Baton Rouge, uh, this has been top of mind for me my entire career. My, my first ever project that I ever worked on was uh, around uh, an environmental justice issue associated with a, a chemical uh, company in, in South Louisiana, uh, as well as the relocation of an indigenous population of, of Homa Indians south of Homa, who I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, due to climate change and the impacts of, of uh, storms. And, and I believe when we've heard it time and time again, we've heard, we've heard Mike Worth from, from Chevron say it, we've heard Larry Fink say it, we hear it over and over again. The only way this happens, and the only way that we get this done, is if we do it in a just and equitable manner. Uh, and what it highlights is the complexity of, uh, of the climate crisis right now. And when we think about, it's easy, it's maybe not easy, but it's, it's much easier to, to model just the uh, climate side of things. It might be easy to model the economic pieces by themselves uh, and then the, the policy, the social policy by themselves. The reality is, is we have to create that Venn diagram where those, all of those intersect and we have to account for all of these when we're doing this. Now we're seeing some positive progress, right? FEMA using the social vulnerability index in their risk maps now for their flood, uh, national flood insurance program. Uh, for the first time, uh, I, I researched, I wrote a paper on this 22 years ago, and it took until about three years ago uh, for them to finally enact it and get it in place. But uh, things move you know, at, at a pace that we can't control sometimes, but we're seeing a lot more attention being paid to these things. We're seeing questions uh, being asked that were never asked before. And, and our clients are, it, are really becoming hyper aware of the communities that they work in uh, and live in. Some of them move faster than others and more aggressively, uh, but I, I see progress and there are tangible uh, aspects of 
what's happening uh, in the, particularly in the government and public sector side of things that is great. We just had the, uh, the benefit of working with uh, the Department of Transportation on a disadvantaged index uh, where we helped develop an index to assess how disadvantaged a community was in terms of access to nature, access to transportation. And that metric is now being used to help uh, in considerations and planning for infrastructure and IRA infrastructure spending. And that's been published, it's out there, the index is out there, open for everyone to see. Uh, and so I would encourage you to take a look at that. So these are continuing to happen, but it needs to happen aggressively and, and, and justly. And there are certain industries, so uh, all great points, Stephen. There are certain industries that I think are better at it than others uh, because they just do it on, on a, um, on a consistent basis, uh, particularly power and utilities. Um, there's the eminent domain. There's the um, the cultural relations groups in in those in those organizations that are navigating how to engage with um, First Nations, Indigenous populations uh, based on on their er everyday business, delivering power. Because uh, there's the yeah, uh, and, and then I've also worked with forestry companies that are also um, in BC, for example, there's the, um, the Tenure Transfer Act that is occurring where they're transferring the, uh, the tenure of the trees back to the indigenous populations, the First Nation populations. And as a result of that, they are now becoming stewards of the natural resources that some of these corporations are, um, are, are leveraging for, for profitability. And it's a game changer in terms of how are they now going to engage with these First Nations? What, how do, what are the values of these First Nations? How are they going to start prioritizing those values? How are they gonna come together so that it becomes a win-win situation? So I think there's a lot of complexity like you identified in terms of the, the problems that need to be solved because there are values that these, um, that these communities have have. Uh, they need to be communicated in a way that is understood by the counterparty. That counterparty then needs to take in, a, in account for those values in their calculus. Those dialogues need to happen. The data needs to be ultimately ingested so that they can start informing their decisions. And to Stephen's point, as we do these analyses in silos, it's really hard to combine all of those factors together in order to come up with a holistic answer. Uh, the, the indices is, is, is a greater approach, uh, having uh, stakeholder engagement is, is, a, is a, another approach. There's so many uh, ways to potentially engage with uh, populations and ultimately use data, technology, and, uh, and stakeholder engagement plans in order to ultimately uh, come to a viable solution. But we have a lot of work to do. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think that there are some that are doing it and they can be the leaders, and then there hopefully will be some fast followers as well, particularly around infrastructure where there's going to be a, um, a physical understanding of the dislocation of certain values that indigenous populations have and the profit centers that the uh, organizations or the co companies are, are looking to achieve. Okay, we have a question over here. Yeah. Thank you, and not to you know, detract from the question that Ashley asked, which yeah. I think is a very important topic to bring up. But I also wanted to bring it back to the data piece. Yeah. And you've talked a little bit about um, carbon offsets and the issues with um, biocarbon and all of that stuff. And I think there's a bit of a, I've seen a bit of a disconnect between academic experts saying the most important thing for carbon and for all these other things is to keep forest standing. And then the data and the uncertainty with concerns with additionality and permanence that make that harder for a company to, to trust at risk of you know, being told that their carbon offsets are all junk. And, um, but I wonder if you've seen from the industry and the corporate side with all these companies making biodiversity pledges and other types of credits coming into the picture, you've seen a bit of a move towards going back to nature-based offsets. Uh, the that's a great question, and, and I, I don't want to confuse nature-based, maybe carbon all the time with biodiversity and the value of biodiversity. Uh, we, from a carbon standpoint and decarbonization standpoint, we will always uh, sort of look at insetting options first, 
right? Those are the, the, the very tangible things a company can do internally, its own actions that it can take, how it's procuring services, what it's doing with its sole products that, that uh, are more easily measurable at times and, and more within their control. Uh, secondary to that, then you've got that offset market, you've got that biodiversity sort of value that, that rolls into a lot of, uh, of their strategy. And when they're setting targets, uh, we can set targets separate carbon, separate than uh, nature, right? And we can have nature-based targets, and, and you're fortunate to have one of my colleagues sitting right next to you who is, who is uh, extremely well-versed in this nature space and, and biodiversity space. Uh, I don't know that I've seen a trend yet. Uh, we, we, we certainly have companies uh, and clients that are looking into those and, and looking into that value, particularly in, in organizations that work with large land footprints that, that have seen lots of change, right? Oil and gas companies that, that you know, put in wellheads and have large footprints uh, on site. But I don't know that we have enough data yet for me to say there's a, a trend. Uh, I'm still unsure. I, I think it will emerge. Uh, and, and I hope that it does because the overall value beyond carbon is is uh, is worth it. Maybe, but maybe I'll, I'll push yeah. push on, on that one a bit. Um, there's companies that I, I kind of segment into two categories. There's the ones that want to demonstrate to the world that they're committed, and then there's the ones that want to use carbon as a commodity in order to achieve a, a, a corporate purpose. And the value of those two different offsets are very, are, are very different. Mm -hmm. So to Stephen's point, the biodiversity um, co-benefits that are achieved through nature-based solutions has a higher premium to it. Mm -hmm. Not only does it, why? Because it's just better for the environment. There's a lot of other um, beneficial factors uh, involved with it. But from a corporate side, why, why, do, why would you ascribe a premium to it? One is because you can tell a better story. You can look at your SDGs and you can line up everything that this particular activity does to your SD, SDGs um, and, and your commitments to those SDGs. And based on that, uh, there's a lot of organizations that may want to, and not greenwash, but just tell a story about their commitment so that they can identify a high value offset that has a premium associated with it that they can tout to the world that they're not only committed, but they're committed um, based on X, Y, and Z. And given those, those additional co-benefit factors, they're willing to pay a premium of high value for that. Then you have these chemical companies, and not to say that all chemical companies are like this, but they have a corporate purpose that they want to achieve. They have hard to abate areas of their of their portfolio. They have a target that they may have explicitly commi uh, committed to, or they may have an implicit uh, commitment that they want to achieve, and they want to ultimately uh, like engage in a, a strategy. And as part of that, they will find a lowest cost offset that will ultimately achieve those goals. Not to say that they're mining uh, the the um, like offsets that are that are not good quality they are decent quality but they might not have all of the co-benefits that you would potentially tout to a marketplace and put it in your IR package um, so that's that's what I've been seeing in the marketplace from from a um, from an offset perspective from a corporate perspective on, on in, in terms of how they're ascribing value um, in terms of of like just the offset market in general to achieve their goals what I would say is that it's extremely nascent a lot of organizations are not really leveraging it to the, to the and, and, and the SBTI is not really in favor of it. So there's a lot of con conflicting uh, commitments that organizations might feel that they, should they, should they not, how do they want to do it? So there's a lot of um, backroom dialogue in terms of what is an offset, how can it help achieve our corporate purpose, is it a cop-out, is it not a cop-out, what should we do? Uh, and then there's a lot of other industrial-based um, offset activities that organizations can also engage in that are perceived as carbon avoidance and not carbon removal. and does that have more value or less value? Is it additional? Is it permanent? Like, what is the math? What is the calculus behind that? So I think there's a lot of backroom talk around organizations that are really doing those types of evaluations. So, so I want to thank... I want to explain what a carbon offset well, is in terms of such a range of knowledge and 
Yeah, we will. Unfortunately, we're out of time here, but <laughs> <laughs> I, and, and I do want to continue that conversation if anyone wants to join it. So I'd like to thank uh, all of you. I'd like to thank Aspen for having us. I hope that we've sort of communicated this is a pretty multidimensional effort. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Please come. We will be in the Deloitte uh, lounge uh, tent on the other side of campus for most of the afternoon. If you'd come have a cup of coffee with us, we'd love to chat.